So our last uh, sponsor presentation comes from Vast. Of uh, Vasca. Uh, Capsalis. Okay, I was going to say Vasily, but then I saw the Vast, and I was like, well, it's almost like Vast without the T. Um, <laughs> great company to work for. And uh, Doug Hatfield is going to be joining him as well. So welcome. Working properly, everyone here? Perfect. Actually, it's got louder now. Perfect. So I'm going to try and cover a few topics. I'm not going to drill down in massive depth on them due to uh, the fact that it would probably take three weeks to go through it all. But uh, um, I'll give you a very quick introduction to VAST for those that aren't familiar. Um, we're then going to talk about some announcements we've made very recently in the last few weeks, which relates to things such as re uh, retrieval augmented generative AI, ve vector database, graph database functionality, and also what we've announced in terms of the VAST Insight Engine. So those are the topics on for, for discussion today. And I'll also at the end talk about the Cosmo developer or Cosmos developer community as well, because that's going to be an important part of it, and it's very much tied up with NVIDIA as well, if I'm honest. So we'll move, start to move on. So quick introduction to VAST. What is VAST? Well, essentially, it's a sort of parallel data platform architecture. <laughs> so it has a lot of the features you'd expect from HPC storage, but in many ways, it does a lot of other things as well. So we can do fast, very fast reads. We've got reasonably fast writes. Uh, we deliver extremely high IOs per second. The IOPS are massive because it's all, an all NVMe flash platform. And as you can see from that architecture, um, it's, it's essentially built out of stateless containers at the top, which are running storage controllers. It's got the media at the bottom, which is a mix of storage class memory and NVMe flash, QLC flash. And then that's all accessed over an NVMe over fabric network. So what it really is is a big cluster, effectively, of, st of storage and compute. But as well as being a storage controller function in the compute layer, we can also build in extra functionality, which is where this Insight engine comes from. So I'll move on to the next slide. So we've got some really good references. There's, there's actually a few in the room as well. I think, Alistair, you've got a system having your hands up? Yes? It's yeah. not as big as tech yet. Yeah. We're <laughs> um, and then there's some stuff going into Bristol as well. I don't think anyone from Bristol's here now, are they? No, oh, one. Oh yes, Tom's in the corner. I spotted him. Well done. And so that's that's all good, successful stuff in the UK. Um, we've also got these references here on this deck here. So TAC did some really interesting work with us. They're getting good data reduction because that's one of our features because NVMe flash is a little bit more expensive than spinning rust. So we have to use data reduction to you know, try and drive the economics of it and make it more competitive. So that's one of the features that we have within the system. And actually on their scientific data, they're getting about two to one. But we have seen other use cases. I think Doug's recently been doing some stuff with NetCDF data. And you got nine to one on the uncompressed data, yeah, which is pretty impressive. But that was on uncompressed data. And I think we have a question that we need to discuss in our heads, which is around if data is pre-compressed, is it better to expand it? In which case you increase the network traffic a bit. But you know there are things like compression in flight that could be used. So there's some interesting conversations I think to be had on that topic going forward. So yeah, TAC, TAC um, we're using some nuclear physics codes, and they got some really good results from us. I think the reason for that was they were driving a lot of connections on the system at once, and uh, as a result of that, it actually outperformed Lustre, and they have now pretty much eliminated Lustre, haven't they, from memory, Doug? Well, well TAC the, from their the, system. Um, the CTO at TAC, of course, yeah. was the chairman of the Lustre. Correct. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know that. And then another. Another site in Europe is Chineka, and they've they've started off with about 50 petabytes, but I think they've now gone to 100 from memory. So again, they're finding it's very successful and it's working for them. So it, depend, you know, it depends on what sort of workloads you've got, but Vast itself is capable of doing HPC very well, but it also does a very good job on AI. So I'm going to move forward now. I'll try and build this up. So we're going to start to focus a little bit more on the AI topic now, I think, with these slides. So this shows a sort of typical pipeline for AI. So the idea is you, you collect data. Quite often people would do that with a Kafka cluster or something like that. Then you spend a lot of time preparing the data. At that point, when you've got curated data, you can start to think about training models. And then at the end of, at the end of that process, you've got a model that you can use for inference. And actually, quite a lot of time is then spent looking at the inputs and the outputs and doing inference logging to see how accurate that model you know, is and how it performs. So that's, that's a sort of key workflow there. And then underneath each of those stages, there, there are different technologies. I've already mentioned Kafka. I'll use the laser, actually. That's better. I've gone too, no, I've gone too far. I meant to Someone use the laser. Really fast, the laser. Yeah, I've got the laser pointer. I pressed the wrong button, though. Bear with me two seconds. That's the one I want to go back to, isn't it? Yeah, it's that one. Right, laser time. Here we go. So, yeah, you've got these different uh, categories underneath uh, in terms of sort of either data platform or storage architecture. So in the middle there, you've got sort of parallel 
file systems for the AI training at the moment, they're the most pre prevalent. Um, you might then have NFS on the inference side and then maybe S3 on the logging side. So there's quite a lot of different architectures to maintain. It makes it more complex. If I sort of build through the sort of build up on this slide, so it shows that the first category could be cloud or enterprise class storage. That's one storage category. The next storage category will be parallel file systems. That's another category to manage. And then at the end, yeah, you might be back onto your cloud and enterprise storage, but maybe with some S3 and some slightly different protocols in there. Um, and that just really does add to the cost because you'd be having to multiply up different types of storage. Plus also it's operational complexity and time consumption as well. The, uh, in fact, particularly with the parallel file systems, I think the model training part does take a long time. You know, it's just one of those things. It's a big job. You know, ChatGPT took months to train, and that's typical with these very large AI models. But obviously, there's a lot you can do with smaller models as well. So let's move through these slides. Yeah, so this st slide starts to talk about RAG. I'm just going to build this out because it will take too long otherwise. Um, so at the bottom, we've got the model build process, which is what we've already sort of discussed. And actually, it's put the VAST in there already. So VAST is able to service all of those workloads very efficiently. And that is because we are an NVMe platform, effectively. It's all flash. It's all very quick. Lots of IOs per second, so lots of IOPS. And as a result of that, you are able to actually service the data ingest process, replacing, say, a Kafka cluster. You're able to provide a platform for the data scientists to use to do the curation. Uh, and there's actually minimal data transformation needed with our system in terms of overhead because it's actually very, very fast. So you don't have to do things like structure things with Parquet format in order to, you know, provide a different type of query. It's actually very good at handling any shape query, you know, whether it's column or row based, whatever. It can do that really efficiently. And then the last stage, the AI training, that tends to be very heavyweight because you're having to hit lots of data and it's quite random IO patterns. But again, we deliver really well on that piece of the equation. So that's the sort of model building stage. And then when you go to the top, you've also got the deployment stage. And so often there, you might be dealing with something like, I don't know, a customer request that comes in. Again, you might still have some curated data that's been prepared. But then uh, at the other end of the thing, you're doing, you know, you're actually doing inference on those queries that are coming in and actually handling them. And you'll still be logging those as well to make sure that you know, what's been produced in terms of the results is correct. So I think this is going to build up a bit more. Yeah, here we go. So it's putting vast over everything on this slide. Um, but the point is we can do these workloads as well. And actually, the interesting part on this slide really is the application of RAG, which is that retrieval augmented generative AI. So what I'll start to say about that is I think the first use cases we're going to see with that are going to be around things like language models, because what you'll probably get is you'll get customer service chatbots that rather than using ChatGPT to produce a very random answer, will actually say, I can go back to the database, I can actually check a, a set of curated answers that we've got that we know are valid and correct, and we can use those. In addition to that, it'll also do things like pass security tokens. So if you're dealing with personal information, you can actually make sure that only that information that is meant to be seen in relation to that request is seen. It's not handling out, you know, handing out data that shouldn't be handed out to the wrong person. So, you know, I don't know if Doug phones up his uh, tax man or something, um, and he gets given my data. That's obviously a problem. But uh, you know, in, in another scenario, um, it might not be so important. So it depends on the use case, really. So I've got ten minutes. Okay, I'll keep moving. <laughs> So yeah, this is the official NVIDIA, NVIDIA version of uh, the RAG slide, and it's essentially the same process, but there's a few extra things in here I'll point to as well, which we are supporting as well. So, um, so within this here, actually I should look at this, shouldn't I? Um, so NVIDIA's, who's heard of NVIDIA NIMS? So it's, yeah, there's a few hands gone up, not many. So that's NVIDIA's inference microservices. So those basically are small inference engines that can run on a platform. And the idea is they'll do certain functions. And actually, part of that is really lending itself to what I'm going to talk about at the end, which is this Cosmos community that we're setting up. And the idea really is that people will come together and build these micro service functions that allow you to do certain things with certain types of data. Now, I think you know, looking at the people that joined already, uh, it's going to be quite heavily focused on customer service engagements. But I can actually see other scenarios there. For instance, I think things like weather forecasting, um, there's a lot of situations where you, know, you might be able to access some curated data because you know that when you have these sort of inputs, you'll get this type of output from part of the model. And it could be, you know, you're looking at physics-informed neural networks, or it could be even a, an image transform model for something like rain, short-term rain prediction. 
um, you can then go and retrieve data relating to that rather than actually computing it. So that should give some energy efficiencies, which would be very valuable. But also, um, you know, I think it will actually build a good corpus of material that's actually useful for modelling and research purposes as well. But I think some of that work is stuff that needs to be done. It's work in progress. It's not stuff that is real yet. But I think you know, we'll start to see a lot of applications of RAG coming in the future. The other thing this will do as well, if you look on here, there's a vector database reference in the corner. The whole idea of a vector database is it gives you really powerful search capabilities. So effectively, you can um, have a large unstructured data lake full of data, but because the data has come in and it's been processed by these uh, inference engines and you've filled out the embeddings in the vector database, it'll give you the ability to search much more quickly through that unstructured data. So there's some quite sort of powerful capabilities there. One of the limitations today at the moment is that the vector databases don't scale very well, but actually that's what, one of the things we're fixing with the Vast Insight engine. So I'll move on. I'm going to click through this for the sake of speed. So, yeah, so one of the points I should have probably made on the previous slide was that uh, a lot of uh, data is often out of date in these situations because of the time lag between taking the data in, curating it, and then retraining the model. Whereas what we're trying to do here now is deliver something that's much more real time. But I can see some risks there, of course, because if you're reliant on data that's just come in, you know, it could have errors in it and things. So, you know, part of this process will be what can we do with these inference engines to actually you know, qualify the data effectively and make sure that it's actually suitable to be used and curated? So there's lots of questions still to be answered, but I think it's quite an exciting area of science. So yeah, this starts to talk about the Vast Insight engine. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking a concept, which is the Vast database, which we already have, which is a tabular database that sits on our platform. And it allows you to make you know, references to data in a structured data lake. Uh, but we're going to extend that to support vectors and graphs. So that will be a very powerful feature. It's not available yet, but it'll be available early 2025. So this is kind of roadmap stuff. Uh, and it will leverage our architecture, which is based on this dis uh, disaggregated shared everything architecture with storage class memory in each of the uh, storage boxes effectively. And that will actually allow you to then distribute that index across the system and therefore perform very fast search results. So that's, that's the aim really. And as I say, we're running NVIDIA microservices uh, and we've also got this concept of the vast data engine, which will do functions and triggers. So as data comes in, you can kind of kick off certain processes and actually handle that data as it comes in. Um, and it's, yeah, we're, what we're trying to do here really is aim for very real time performance on these processing services. I'm going to move forward because I must be running low on time. <laughs> I'm asking you, we should need a five minute one. So I'm just going to build this slide out again because the build outs take ages. Yeah, so this is the concept of the vast data engine, or insight engine, sorry. And the idea here really is that, we, yeah, so you'll have application interfaces into it at the top, so up here. But then underneath, you've got this data store and this database. And the idea is that, yeah, as I said, the database can store these vectors or graphs or other structures. Um, and the idea there really is that you have atomic security. So again, you know, if you, should, if you do, shouldn't be exposing certain data to certain users, they won't get exposed to it as built in with security tokens. But also, um, you know, it gives you this ability to search that whole data set very, very rapidly using the embeddings within the graph database. And as I said here, we've got the triggers on there as well. And then they, they can kick off processes using the NVIDIA NIMS services, essentially. So I think overall, it's a very powerful architecture. But I think what I would say is it's going to need people like the people in the room to make it all work properly, because actually different data sets have different characteristics. Now, we have got a community started already. So we've got people like CoreWeave, who are obviously a large US hyperscaler, Lambda similar category as well. Run AI, they do software, Supermicro is in it, NVIDIA is in it, Deloitte, and X as well, which is Elon Musk. So there's some sort of big, Equinix as well. There's some big players in there, and they're, they're all going to be contributing to building these microservice type models that we can put on the system. And obviously, they'll have different use cases, but I think the aim is to try to make as much of it open as possible so people can share in it, because uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to be tackling lots of different complex problems. And if it's almost like, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's going to be, it's going to be open source, Doug, do you think? Quite likely. Uh, a lot of it will well, be. Yeah, a lot of it will be open source. Yeah, so, so that's, that's going to then add significant value, because then you will be able to look up an index of inference engines that you want to use. And you know, if they're suitable or can be adapted, you can do that to you know, your particular use case. So I think I'm pretty much nearly there. So this is the uh, website which we're referring to as thecosmos.ai. Uh, it sounds a bit, a bit like a rip-off of Alistair's system. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, that's, that's the community that's being built. It's called the Cosmos community. And if you go on there, you, you know, you'll start to see some people have started entering things. But this is going to build up over time. And I think really it's going to kick off in earnest early 2025 because that's when the product is you know, effectively launched. So we've, anou we've announced it. We've got a habit in Vast of pre-announcing things, but uh, it will be built by then. So that's the end. So thank you. Any questions arising from that?